Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Leaving the Farm, right here on Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, where information never sleeps. We are listener-supported radio station, where if you'd like to donate, please visit us at www.freedomslips.com and click on our support pages. Every little bit helps. We're also simulcasting, of course, on TammyPepperman.org through No Borders Radio at nobordersradio.co.uk If you'd like to support our efforts, please do so by clicking on the donate button under the No Borders player right here at TammyPepperman.org Wow. So yesterday the Russian CIA which of course is um, Ria Novosky indicated that Russia did not intend on attacking Ukraine, of course, and all of these things. And then today, the Ukraine is releasing Russian paratroopers who, according to the CIA, were in the Ukraine, of course. is such a joke. Diane Feinstein is falling down on her cronies. Of course, Diane Feinstein is the director of these operations. Russia is a corporation located in the District of Columbia, as is the Ukraine. And if they can espouse to you that your brother and your sister are at war, you pay for these things. Let me tell you what happens when these things occur and somebody infiltrates your country say 1948 somebody somebody infiltrates a country and they kill a whole bunch of citizens and that same somebody comes right back in and says they will protect you that somebody of course are corporations and the cash in as people die through death derivatives, insurance, diagnosis and repair, bottomy bronze, hedge funds, hedge fund management. Our last year, dailymail.co.uk, mass grave uncovered containing dozens of Palestinians killed in 1948 war that founded Israel. Now, of course, this is attributed to the eight stages of genocide. Okay, you you witness these things as Congress comes into your country and kills you and your children, kills your brothers and sisters, and then tells you that somebody else did it. And we'll go into that in a moment. Now the eight stages of genocide, this is from a paper written for the State Department by Gregory H. Stanton, president of Genocide Watch, of course. Number one, classification. All cultures have categories to distinguish people into, quote, us and them by ethnicity, race, religion, or nationality, German and Jew, Hutu and Tutsi, Bipolar societies that lack mixed categories such as Rwanda and Burundi are the most likely to have genocide. From BuzzFeed.com, this man filmed himself being arrested and tasered in front of his kid, St. Paul, Minnesota. Resident Chris Lowley says that he was sitting in the front of a bank for 10 minutes waiting to pick up his kids from school when police officers began to question and harass him for no apparent reason. I'm looking at his photo and he appears to be black, a classification. Lowley filmed the incident which re rapidly escalated as he repeatedly claimed, quote, I didn't do anything wrong, end quote. The officers, a man and a woman, tell Lowley he is going to jail but never say what he has done wrong or that what he will be charged with. Quote, the problem is I'm black, end quote. Lowley tells one of the officers, 
quote, it really is. I didn't do anything wrong. End quote. Through the last half of the video, though the last half of the video is dark due to Lolly dropping the phone, you can hear him screaming, quote, those are my kids right there. End quote. The male officer then used his taser on Lolly and there is a sound like children screaming in the background. Quote, the assault he says this is assault the incident took place in January but law enforcement reportedly held on to Lolly's phone until the charges were dropped in July meaning he couldn't upload the video he had taken until recently before the charges were dropped Lolly had been charged with trespassing disorderly conduct, and obstructing the legal process. Number one, he was parked in front of a bank. Who called their privateers to the scene to terrorize a black citizen and his children? Who did this? For Big Story AP.org, Ferguson rally marks three weeks since Brown's death. Ferguson, Missouri. Hundreds converged on Ferguson on Saturday to march for Michael Brown, the unarmed black 18-year-old who was shot and killed by a white police officer three weeks ago to this day. His death stoked national discourse about police tactics and race, which the rally's organizers pledged to continue. Led by Brown's parents and other relatives, Saturday's throng peacefully made their way down Cantal Drive in the St. Louis suburb to a makeshift memorial that marked the spot where Brown was shot August 9th by Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson. Well, we know that his life is not going to be in vain, the Reverend Spencer Booker of St. Louis St. Paul AME Church said into a microphone standing in the middle of the street amid candles, placards, stuffed animals, and now wilted flowers. Quote, we know you're going to even the score God, we know you're going to make the wrong right. Brown's parents, Mother Leslie McSpadden and Father Michael Brown Sr. encircled the memorial with other family members during the prayers, including one by a Muslim clergy member. Hours later, hundreds of protesters again gathered in front of the suburban police department and fire station blocking the road. Fiery speeches by way of speakers mounted to a car gave way to another march with chants of, quote, quote, with chants of, quote, if we can't have it, we're shutting it down, end quote. Some lobbed angry insults in a line of Ferguson officers and state police who stood guard at a taped-off section of the city's parking lot, but the numbers of protesters dwindled to a double digits by late afternoon. Wilson, a six-year police veteran, has not been charged. Eight stages of genocide number two. Symbolization. We give names or other symbols to the classifications. We name people Jews or gypsies or distinguish them by colors or dress and apply the symbols to members of groups. Classification and symbolization are universally human and do not necessarily result in genocide unless they lead to the next state de stage, dehumanization. Just after Michael Brown was shot six times by this racist officer following racist policy, which is adhering to racist congressional acts, 
it was spoken and whispered around that he may have robbed a bank, but that the officers did not know that, or may have robbed a convenience store, but the officers did not know these things when he was shot. It never, ever, ever had anything to do with him being shot. He was just killed, gunned down on your street by your government who then turned around to dehumanize him before you. It further was festered through the use of media maintaining that this section of town or this section of the country was poverty stricken and low income which is a further classification measure. This was further promoted that this is a mainly black community which further dehumanized these citizens in Ferguson, Missouri. Classification, symbolization, dehumanization. Number three, one group denies the humanity of the other. Members of it are equated with animals, vermin, insects, or diseases. Dehumanization overcomes the normal human revulsion against murder. At this stage, hate propaganda in print and on hate radios is used to vilify the victim group. In combating this dehumanization incitement to genocide should not be confused with protected speech. Genocidal societies lack constitutional protection for countervailing speech and should be treated differently than democracies. Well, why? Is this part of the genocide process? When this thing in Ferguson first occurred, the first thing that happened was corporate counsel called in 40 FBI agents to protect the corporations from anything that might occur due to the murder of a human being. Number four, organization. Genocide is always organized, usually by the state, often using militias to provide deniability of state responsibility. They're blaming Darren Wilson. They're not blaming policy. They're not blaming corporate counsel. They're not blaming general counsel. And they're not blaming the 1924 Racial Integrity Act that was passed by Congress in order to promote the genocide of black human beings and those that are mentally infirm, um, sick, disabled. Sometimes organization is informal. Special army units or militias are often trained and armed. Forty FBI agents showed up and just after that was the National Guard. The 1947 National Security Act maintains that human beings are enemies of the state. A nation is defined as a corporation, such as the bank that the father was sitting in front of when the bank was protected from anything that he could do unto it, called trespassing, and his whole family was terrorized as he was tased in front of his minor children. Number five, polarization. Extremists drive the groups apart. The FBI came out in 2012 and said they were the extremists. ISIS is an arm of the FBI. Hamas is an arm of the FBI. Hate groups broadcast polarizing propaganda. 
Yes, the FBI and the CIA are these hate groups, the extremist groups, such as those that are listed on the Southern Poverty Law Center. They work for Congress. Those are not victims. Those are FBI-centered and CIA-centered groups infiltrating humanity and pretending that they're racist. The KKK itself was established by the Democrats, a party of Congress. Preparation number six. Victims are identified and separated out because of their ethnic or religious identity. What you see in Ferguson, Missouri with all of the housing developments and low-income housing uh, developments that are there is a federal program that put them there through the 1974 Reclamation Acts and, and related um, the 1934 Federal Housing Act, 1933 National Housing Act, or vice versa, I can't remember. I went on into the 70s. and. Um, Congress establishes this. This is part of the preparation. This was also facilitated through the ACLU, the affirmative action laws, NAACP. Those are all preparations. Death lists are drawn up. Now you saw that again this year as well with the VA. The VA had death lists of veterans that they wanted to be offed and those were the veterans that were killed quote accidentally in their hospitals due to long wait periods and other quote accidental and quote means. Members of victim groups are forced to wear identifying symbols their property is expropriated. They are often segregated into ghettos, deported into concentration camps, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Israel, Palestine, or confined to a famine-struck region and starved. This embargo around Israel and everywhere that was created by Congress is creating famine. The IMF further creates famine by controlling the inflation rates and the cost of your commodities driving them up so that you cannot afford to live. You are experiencing this in all places. At this stage a genocide emergency must be declared. Well, in this directive to the State Department, he's talking about FEMA, Federal Emergency Management, because when the federal government implicates war against you, it needs places to put you. Every time there's a state of emergency called out, there's another institution created to keep you in. states of emergency, of course, refer to states of being, the human being. Number seven, extermination begins and quickly becomes a mass killing legally called genocide. It is the extermination to the killers because they do not believe their victims to be fully human. Michael Brown was just gone down by a cop. He was seen as a number. Number eight, denial. Denial is the eighth stage that always follows a genocide. It is among the surest indicators of further genocidal massacres. The perpetrators of genocide dig up the mass graves, burn the bodies, try to cover up the evidence, and intimidate the witnesses. They deny that they committed any crimes and often blame what happened on the victims. And again, I refer to the dailymail.co.uk mass grave uncovered containing dozens of Palestinians killed in 1948 war that founded Israel. The 
Congress is a a uh, tricky snake in the grass. Now, from their policy, they have a book you can follow if you are interested in promoting a war on the ground anywhere and entering into the criminal confederacy with them. It's called the Post-Conflict Constitutional Drafter, Drafter's Handbook. This is prepare, prepared by the Public International Law and Policy Group, Paul R. Williams, Executive Director, Elizabeth Hahn, Post-Conflict Constitution Project Director, Cassandra Tillingat, Senior Research Associate, Emily Nugent, Senior Research Associate, and this happens to be the 2007 edition. So after you kill all of the citizens on the ground in a country and you convince them that they did it, the first thing you want to do is pick your type of government. The first part of the book, of course, is the identification of the state. Then you want to go into the supremacy of the Constitution, national identity, citizenship, official state capital, flag, anthem, symbol, And of course, as it says here, confederations exist when two or more pre-existing units get together and enter into peace treaties and pacts. The next step is removal of the president or prime minister. You don't, you don't want the old government in there because they're not following your policy or anything. So what you want to do is you want to claim that they have weapons of mass destruction. And then when you find Saddam Hussein, you want to immediately hang him without a trial so that nobody can say anything and uh, get rid of that government so that you can step in there with your own. Now, I hope everybody's taking notes because, you know, everybody wants to be like Congress. The second part of the removal of the president or prime minister, of course, goes into depth on the disability or death of the executive. Well, you can beat the hell out of him like they just did to uh, George uh, over there in the UK. You can paralyze them like they did to uh, Jim Brady to promote gun control laws. You can call them insane, you can call them infirm, you can give them cancer or whatever you need to do. And of course the second part is impeachment of the executive. And everybody's been watching that in uh, Panama and uh, North Korea. I mean they were hell on North Korea for the longest time. Uh, when they first went in there and wrapped around his country uh, way back when during the Korean War when Congress attacked Korea so they could formulate their own government there. The next thing you want to do is structure the legislative branch. Pick your type of electoral system. Uh, ensure that you have your collection of revenue and taxes, auditing requirements, and, and the, of course the next is the central bank. You want to set up that central bank, lay out your purpose, powers and functions, independence, governments. Now the next question after you perpetrate war of course on somebody is whether you, you know the, the level of secularism or state religion. How are you going to drive everybody apart? You gotta teach them religious beliefs, and and um, of course, if they're not sinners and they don't know that they're sinners or anything, you can't move them anywhere. And if they don't fear death, you can't do anything. So you've gotta really get in there and, and work hard with your CIA to torture them. Really get in there and, and you know throw acid on their females and, and gas their their children like in Syria last year when Congress gassed the Syrian children, 1,200, 1,300 children. Got to really work hard at, at uh, killing all of the citizens on the ground so you can offer them protection.
It's even got a sample language in here. Of course, language is stemming from Babel. Can't have Babel if everybody speaks the same word or anything. Right under the sample language is official state religion and no religious protection. You want to ha make sure you have that disparity there because, you know, if, if everybody's not the same, there's no polarity, there's no classification or dehumanization or anything. It says in here you can have secularism while acknowledging religion and, and of course, straight up secularism, religious religion as a source of law. So next part of this protection of religious freedoms you got to get in there and put in your constitution now that you have indoctrinated them with a religious belief you got to teach them that they can speak about it and, and practice that indoctrination uh, as to your bidding uh, otherwise you're going to call them out as witches and, and other nasty things and put them through some some horrible trials using your judges and um, you know that that's always messy. You, you don't want a lot of mess. You just wanna you wanna really mess with their minds using priests and psychiatrists and the constant threat of war or rest. You wanna use that one because it, it's the most efficient. Everybody gets fearful if they're constantly threatened with arrest. You know, for every citizen in Ferguson, Missouri, they have had three arrest warrants issued for them. Every citizen in Ferguson, Missouri has been uh, with three arrest warrants issued. It's quite ironic because a lot of you out there that have these unpaid traffic tickets and unpaid fines and things like this, you don't really realize those arrest warrants, but you're being asked to come by privateers into the courts of bail constantly hindered constantly threatened oh my gosh my 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 plates are about to expire they're gonna start picking me up I gotta get that license gotta register gotta register of course under the protection of religious freedoms ownership of natural resources it's a very, very important part. Department of Natural Resources is very, extremely important to the federal government. Always, 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 always. Because without that, you can't really trick them out from the center point of their communities. The Development Commission has to be there in the county. The county commission, board of commissioners, got to have everything localized. Otherwise, it's all spread out and you can't trick humanity out in the most efficient way. Shared ownership, uh, vest control of natural resources, allocation of revenue, authority to declare a state of emergency, restrictions during a state of emergency, duration of a state of emergency, constitutional enactment, constitutional amendments. Yes, we can amend those original constitutions, type of government, sample language, official religion, blah, blah, blah. It's quite an interesting uh, book. Of course, you can find it over at PILPG, a global pro bono law firm. Who else profits off of war as much as attorneys? There's no founding fathers. There's no founding anything. There was a group of attorneys that thought they'd cash in on genocide and human trafficking. Here's what it says on their, on their little page, their knowledge management post-conflict constitution drafting toolkit. Ooh. Negotiation simulations. PILPG drafts and runs negotiation simulations as part of its post-conflict constitution practice. Yes, you heard that right. This thing is 
promoting war globally at the behest of Congress and offering the war-torn citizens and countries new constitutions. PILG, PG's negotiation simulations focus on current conflict areas around the globe. They are run both for the policymaking community in Washington, D.C., and in country as part of training programs for parties preparing to draft post conflict constitutions. How's that for prettying up war? Parties preparing to draft post conflict constitutions. They're there at the ready. If Diane Feinstein wants to call out and promote and present a war in the Ukraine or Russia or Israel or anything, Diane Feinstein's right there to write their constitution. It's got all the tools, PIL, PG. You can go to uh, Public International Law and Policy Group dot org for more information on how they along with their handlers Congress perpetrate war upon you and then as Moses they come down from that hill and tell it was say it was you and that they're gonna protect you and now you get their rights that they have to sell you they're so amazing amazing demigods and false idols they'll even throw in a flag They'll throw in a, a Star Spangled Banner. Oh, crap. A Statue of Liberty. Give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Three arrest warrants per citizen in Ferguson, Missouri. And that, and that was just an average. That's not talking about the, the family they got eight or nine of them as their children were targets for corporate counsel. And the only way to take the children off of the parents was to get the parents into jail or another institutionalized state. There's no way in hell that if you don't arrest parents living in Nazi Germany before you take their kids for the child sexual abuse industry, they, they, they would attack you otherwise. If they didn't fear your law enforcement, if they didn't fear the FBI, if they didn't fear the CIA, why well, they would remove all of these things from harming humanity. I mean, that's the function of any other biology. I dare you to go try to uh, enter into hand-to-hand -hand combat with a lion and then offer it a constitution. Human beings seem to be the only biology that accepts these concepts. And again, this is also written in Genesis. The Greek Wycliffe's Bible said God collected concepts of night and day and all of this other crap that the Lord God sold him. Why are there no charges for uh, Mr. Wilson? You know, these things are absolutely profound. So the CIA comes out yesterday in Russia and says, Russia doesn't have any intent on the Ukraine. And then the Ukraine today is releasing Russian paratroopers. And again, it, they must be our imaginations because Russia's not at war with Ukraine. Honest. Honest. Diane Feinstein is not promoting a civil war with Ukraine and with Russia to cash in on these things. Honest. Honest. Trust them. Faith. The Moscow Times dot com ex tycoon Kado. Kovsky said Kremlin lying about the Ukraine. Former Russian oil tycoon Mikhail Kordov 
Borkovsky said Friday that Moscow is lying about its involvement in Ukraine and he urged Russians to take action to stop a, quote, unequal war. What's he really saying? This Russian billionaire is saying, you all need to start fighting with each other. Look over there. They want a war with you. I need this. I'm going to invest in this stock here, this product. And in order for me to do that, I want to cover my butt. You guys have to be at war with each other. Now I get to cash in. I get to cash in. Of course I do. Putin and these little oil and gas mongers. Anyway, look at what they've done. It's real funny to commoditize everything, drive up the cost of it, and sell it back to humanity without them ever knowing, ever, ever knowing that it was theirs in the first place. Before an attorney said, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. I'm telling you. Sick. Sick. It's interesting today. Some, um, let's look at it, uh, NASA photos, and there's some spikes appearing in the geography. Iranian president won't talk about the detained Washington Post journalist and his wife, also a journalist. It's interesting. Sounds like the FBI is still a journalist again. An important message from youth in Ferguson. These two little girls holding a sign saying, film the police. We don't want to film it anymore. I don't want to witness genocide. I want to get rid of the FBI. The Congress needs to all be in Gitmo so that humanity can breathe and be free from this genocidal onslaught. We don't need any attorneys. We don't need any general counsels. We don't need any corporate counsels. We don't need anybody to pit us. We don't need any psychiatrists. We don't need any priests. And uh, if humanity was not eating what the FDA, FDA uh, says it should eat, along with the Codex Alimentarius guidelines, a lot of the medical industry is gone as well because you don't need it if you're not sick. If it's not broke, there's no reason to fix it. FDA, of course, is the one with the contracts with the Ethics Commission 2006 rules and procedure of um, Fiji uh, Freeberg's uh, Ethics Commission International Fiji and it's actually uh, to find the site it's F-E-K-I Commission Sick These human beings test subjects. You know these massive graves of these children found in Canada or in Florida, Georgia, everywhere. You know, it's it's always the same. Always the same mass graves at mental institutions 1924 racial integrity act 1933 acts of enablement 1802 indemnification convention 1941 atlantic charter it's always been the same history always repeats itself because they use the same business model time after time after time still the same Roman construct still the same Roman everything of course you can read about the reconstruction of Rome 
and the 1648 Treaty of Westphalia. Cleveland, Ohio, this is from cleveland.com, a Westlake cardiologist whose offices were raided by the FBI in 2012 was charged today in a 16 count federal indictment with performing unnecessary heart procedures and overbilling companies by $7.2 million. He was just doing his job. The FDA and the Ethics Commission have those contracts with each other to use human beings as human test subjects. Everybody's up for grabs since the 1947 National Security Act, which maintained that human beings were dehumanized. They were the enemy of the national state, federal state. And of course, you come along into the 1974 Memorandum 200 to the National Security Council from Henry Kissinger, who said depopulation should be the highest priority of all foreign policy. Of course, that resulted in the 1975 creation of the Office of Population Affairs, which is the Department of Health and Human Services, as a depopulation program. But there's a catch. Before you kill them, if you can eke out as much financial uh, remuneration as possible by per uh, perpetrating unnecessary procedures, by all means do so. Those are derivatives. We don't want to risk losing any money on these stocks. And this is the same thing once again of Nazi Germany, 1928, Bear Corporation got the order from the judge to indemnify Poland. And of course everybody knows what happened after that. What you know is Nazi Germany was simply a court action between Congress and its corporations. Des Moines Register .com lawmaker faces sexual abuse charge. A longtime Iowa legislator was charged with sexual abuse Friday after being accused of having sex with his wife despite being told she lacked the mental capacity to consent. Authorities said Rep. Representative Henry Rahons abused his wife in May at the nursing home where she lived. Donna Rahons, 78, died August 8. Henry Rahons, 78, is a Republican from Garner who, is served, who has served in the House since 1997. He announced this month that he would not, re, that he would not seek re-election in November. Authorities said the felony charge stemmed from an incident at the Concord Care Center in Garner. A criminal complaint filed Friday by the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation said Ray Holmes admitted having sexual activity with his wife, who reportedly had Alzheimer's disease. Henry Ray Hunt's son, Dale Ray Hunt's, called the arrest the result of a, quote, witch hunt. Dale Rahon said Friday evening that the charge was based on a report by Donna Rahon's roommate of unclear sounds coming from behind a curtain. Quote, this is unbelievable what's going on, Dale Rahon said. He's the kindest person you'd ever meet. Dale Rahon said that his wife, that while authorities say his father admitted to sexual contact, that could be anything from a hugger kiss. The criminal complaint said Rahon's acknowledged being told May 15th that his wife did not have the cognitive ability to consent to sexual activity. So here she is in the nursing home, and he's asking his staff if he can have sex with his wife in a nursing home. And he, he apparently got a response that said, no, that, that she's not able to consent. Look, she's in a nursing home. If you don't know that you should not be doing that while she's in the nursing home, Psychopathy is just something so odd. On May 23rd, Henry Rayhans went into his wife's room and pulled the current clothes. The complaint said Donna Rayhans' roommate told authorities she heard noises indicating Henry Rayhans was having sex with Donna Rayhans. The complaint said surveillance video showed Henry Rayhans leaving his wife's room and discarding undergarments into a laundry bag. The complaint said. 
The CIA agents arrested Ray Hunts on Friday. He was released from jail after posting $10,000 cash as bail. Call records show. Elizabeth Barnell, executive director of the Iowa Coalition Against Sexual Assault, said it used to be legal for a man to have sex with a non-consenting wife, but the legislator passed a bill about 25 years ago and defined such an act as a crime. Well, it, it doesn't matter. If, if she's got Alzheimer's and she's like a child, and she doesn't know what's going on, that is always rape. I don't care if that's your wife or your girlfriend or your mother or your sister or whatever. It's always rape. Foul. Foul. These things shouldn't even occur. That's monstrous. Monstrous. How, how can you con even consider things like that? From ARLnow.com, Arlington doctor charged with running oxycodone ring. Dr. Darren McRae Simon, who ran the, quote, within me MD medical clinic at 5275 Lee Highway in Arlington, has been indicted on charges that he ran an oxycodone distribution ring. Starting in February 2013, federal prosecutors say Simon and five co-conspirators wrote, filled, and sold fraudulent prescriptions for more than 11,000 oxycodone pills and other controlled substances. The pills had a total value of nearly $750,000 FRNs, and Simon told the sold the prescriptions for between $500 and $1,000, according to prosecutors. Simon allegedly wrote and sold hundreds of prescriptions for oxycodone and other controlled substances, despite knowing that the individuals in whose names the prescriptions were written were abusing, misusing, distributing, and or selling the drugs, according to a press release. Quote, Simon allegedly had never met any of these purported patients, and he also wrote prescriptions in the names of five, his five co-conspirators, as well as friends, relatives, and fictitious individuals. Simon, 45, is listed in Midlothian, Virginia, resident among the co-conspirators named by prosecutors is Arlington resident Linda Dayo, 21, and Falls Church residents Rada Escobar, 23, and Michael Harris, 21. They are charged with conspiracy to distribute and dispense controlled substances and possession with the intent to distribute controlled substances. According to the indictment, Simon directed... Escobar, a receptionist and medical assistant at Simon's practice, to confirm calls from pharmacists seeking to verify his oxycodone prescriptions. Simon also allegedly directed Escobar to create fraudulent patient history forms and medical records to make it appear that these individuals were actually legitimate patients. The FBI's Washington field office investigated the case. All six suspects are facing up to 20 years in prison and a fine if convicted on the conspiracy or possession charges. Simon faces an additional 1 to 40 years in prison if convicted on three separate charges of distributing a controlled substance to persons under the age of 21. That usually indicates a child sex trafficking ring. Simon and another conspirator are also charged with identity fraud. Yelp reviews for the Within Me Clinic, which specialized in weight loss and hormone therapy, were not complimentary, especially after the clinic closed. Quote, I think they went out of business. One reviewer said, I have no idea what is going on. No one is answering the phones, and the voicemail is full without even an answer or machine introduction. Oh, they're looking for the drugs. <laughs> what the heck is going on? I, I need it. Quote, if I could have, I, if I could give no stars, I would, said another reviewer. I purchased a Groupon and had an appointment on June 30, 23rd. I still have not received six, the B12 shots. Wow. Interesting. Doesn't sound like he was trafficking in B12, though. Oxycodone is much more profitable, apparently. Twisted. Former Ulster legislator charged with felony from the recordonline.com. Highland, a former Ulster County legislator from Marlboro, has been arrested on a felony charge accused 
by state police of possessing more than three thousand dollars worth of stolen property. Frank Felice Felice Cello Jr., who represented the southeastern section of Ulster County for more than two decades as a Republican, has been charged with third degree possession of stolen property a felony. After a two month long investigation, Felice Cello 61 was arrested Tuesday at his home. Investigators say had some he and some associates have been hired to help a Marlboro resident move out of the, a home that had been recently sold. The new owner of the home later reported items that state police Lieutenant Michael Drake described as pool and jacuzzi mechanics to be missing. Felicello was found in possession of the items that had been reported stolen, police say. He was arraigned in Platykill Town Court and released to return to Marlboro Town Court at 4 p.m. August 27th. I haven't gotten an update yet. Uh, when reached by phone, Felicello first said he had no comment, but then press, when press comment, commented further, quote, it's totally untrue, Felicello said, quote, I'm being set up, end quote. He then hung up. Hmm. Maybe you shouldn't hang out with the people you hang out with. From the started Gazette.com, Wellsboro doctor, others indicted on federal charges for people, including a physician, faced trial on federal charges following an, an investigation that the doctor overprescribed some pain medications and prescribed them for people who weren't patients. A Tioga County, Pennsylvania physician and three other men have been indicted by a federal grand jury on charges of unlawful distribution of controlled substances and health care fraud. The indictment charges Dr. John Terry, 63, and Thomas Ray, 51, both of Wellsboro, with possession with intent to distribute a controlled substance and health care fraud, according to U.S. Attorney Peter Smith. David Hatch, 27, of Addison, and Stephen Hafner, Jr., 46, of Elkland, are each charged with health care fraud in the indictment. The defendants allegedly aided and abetted each other in a scheme to obtain benefits from a health care program by false and fraudulent pretenses. From January 2010 through July 2013, Terry provided prescriptions for excessive quantities of oxycodone and other narcotics to individuals who he knew were not seeking the drugs for a legitimate medical purpose. The indictment charges. Terry also allegedly wrote prescriptions for narcotics for individuals who were not his patients, knowing that the federal Medicare program was going to be billed for the unlawful prescriptions the indictment charges. During the execution of a federal search warrant at his office on July 8, 2013, Terry voluntarily agreed to surrender his medical license and his DEA registration. Ah, oh, he's a drug informant! Isn't that always nice to have a ringer when you want to nail human beings with drug crimes? It's always sad when Judas himself gets politically suicided, perhaps. Hmm. Terry Hatch and Hafner were released after, he after a hearing Wednesday in Williamsport before Magistrate Judge William I. Arbuckle III raising state custody on other charges. If convicted, the defendants face up to 20 years in prison on the controlled substance violation, 10 years on the health care fraud charge. Interesting days. Dr. DEA agent. Oh boy, it's almost break time, folks. After the break, we'll continue on and talk about what's going on. Um, very, very sad uh, evidence this week as a woman was worked to death by Starbucks or something. Um, I'll have that story ready in a, just a moment. And, uh, after the break, we'll continue on and talk about more of these things that are happening and, and uh, how you can avoid, well, basically being raised by Congress and cronies. And of course, um, I'll have the public law radio show up on YouTube. Uh, 
shortly after the show here tonight. I've been backlogged and sorry for no updates on the TammyPepperman.org side. This week has been extremely, extremely busy and uh, many, many things have occurred and, and uh, thankful for uh, so many things. And we'll be right back, folks. Stick around. Hi, and welcome back to the second hour of Leaving the Farm right here on Revolution Radio Freedom Sleeps.com where information never sleeps. As well as over on TammyPepperman.org. It's right on No Borders Radio at NoBordersRadio.co.uk. We are listener and reader supported. If you'd like to support us, please visit our respective support us donate buttons. Every little bit helps. You can also join us in chat. And uh, look around on our sites. Very interesting. Hopefully we'll have a special guest on here in a few. Um, and somebody. And this week, and I want to really drive this one home because years ago when I first started out as an advocate, there were so many false allegations against men. I mean, just out of this world. The Amber Alert system was was facilitated, of course, to whack fathers, innocent fathers, who had been falsely accused of domestic violence or child assault or child sexual abuse through false allegations and restrained and you know, all it takes is a female saying, well, he's armed and dangerous. And we saw that so many times. One of them was out in Washington State where, you know, every summer, every June, without fail, and this is years ago before we started Reason Hell about it, every June, without fail, school would let out, dad would assume his parenting time for the summer and all of a sudden go pick up the children she would claim he was armed and dangerous mentally unstable uh, at one point you know he was killed over and over and over again in front of his own children and of course you don't see that very often anymore at all I haven't seen it in years well we, we went on a campaign regarding this and I was you know feverishly working in the background to contact law enforcement and I'm like, oh, look at this. Look at this. This was a family court matter. This was a probate court matter. This is psychiatry here. And you guys just gone down a father to allow his children to be taken by the state. It looks like the tables are churning. KDVR.com Man nearly loses everything when woman makes up a story of kidnap and rape. Greeley, Colorado, a Weld County woman was convicted of three felonies Thursday for falsely accusing a young man of kidnapping and raping her. Catherine Elizabeth Bennett, 21, claimed a male acquaintance, Dustin Toth, took her from a Safeway store parking lot in Windsor on November 24, 2013 and subsequently raped her, but her story, which changed several times, was later proven false, prosecutors said. It was very consensual. We went downstairs to watch movies and later became intimate, Toss says. Over the course of the investigation, Bennett deleted text messages proving that her initial report was false and carried on with her fabricated story, police said. Because of her initial report, a Windsor man was arrested for investigation of serious felonies that caused him to lose his job and damaged his reputation in the community, prosecutors said in a media release. Quote, he was not charged, but the hardships due to his arrest and the publicized allegations continued for this young man who testified that he nearly lost his military career as well because of the false allegations from a woman he considered to be a friend. Quote, it was hard. It, it still is hard. I lost jobs. I wasn't able to find a job for months because of my record, Todd says. It was all dropped, which is why I was able to stay with the military, end quote. Bennett will be sentenced on October 24th. She could face up to nine years in prison.
from the New York Law Journal dot com. Arrested attorney accuses Putnam DA of cover up. An attorney facing witness tampering and bribery counts contends that the Putnam County District Attorney brought the charges to cover up his own corruption. Greg George Galgano, 41, of Westchester County, said in an interview Monday that the charges lodged against him last week are false. He insisted it was not him, but Putnam County District Attorney Adam Levy, who tampered with a witness. The dispute is rooted in Galgano's representation of a local businessman and a restaurateur, Lonnie Zamey, owner of Ariano's Trattoria in Mahapak, and Ariano's Two in Carmel. Zaimi is accused of statutory rape of an employee. Less than two weeks before the third degree rape case went to trial in February, Zaimi was named in a new complaint with the violent sexual abuse of another woman. Gargano contends that the new charges, which were dropped when a grand jury refused to indict his client, were orchestrated by Levy to contaminate the jury pool in the rape case. The rape tra case went to trial in February, but a mistrial was declared with the jury deadlocked. A retrial is slated for September. I can tell you from experience, and if you want to see it with your own eyes, you can go right now to TammyPepperman.org, Consensus Reality, and you will find that all of these jury presentations are orchestrated by none other than the Court Sciences Incorporated at the behest of general counsel. District attorney works hand in hand with, of course, corporate counsel to feverishly discharge congressional bankruptcy. As evidenced in my conversation with Scott K. Summers, corporate counsel for McHenry County, Illinois, last year, this last year. In an interview, and I'll continue reading, in an interview, Gargano accused Levy of persuading the second woman to come forward on the evening of the trial with false charges in an attempt to influence the jury in the initial case. Gargano said he investigated the new complaint when he learned of it 10 days before the rape case went to trial, but did not bribe or tamper with the witness. I, I don't care about all of this crap. I want somebody held accountable for forceful rape. And, uh, you know, of course, if there was intimidation involved or these are false allegations or whatever, then the attorneys should, uh, of course, be deported elsewhere. It's ridiculous, all this infighting and, and crap. McKinney attorney arrested on aggravated assault charge. McKinney attorney Rebecca Hendricks Brewer, who serves as an interim Frisco city attorney, was arrested Thursday for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. She was released from the Collin County Jail after posting $25,000 cash bond. The arrest stemmed from an argument that started Monday evening with her boyfriend, Michael Bola, according to an arrest warrant affidavit. Brewer, 46, is accused of holding a 38 caliber handgun on Bula, shooting out the windshield of his truck and cutting his arm with scissors according to the document issued by the McKinney Police Department. Michael was fearful that Rebecca was going to shoot him. Absolutely, that's what her threats were. The affidavit was included as evidence in a motion filed Thursday by Brewer's ex-husband Greg Brewer, former judge of the 366th District Court. He resigned his position in 2009. Greg Brewer sought a temporary restraining order against his ex-wife in custody of their three sons, ages 15, 13, and 11. The motion, which was granted Thursday, cited, quote, serious and immediate threat to the safety and welfare of the children. Father's motion also states that a minor child recently became, quote, highly intoxicated, end quote, and had to be hospitalized while in Rebecca Brewer's care. Rebecca Brewer, who is listed as a director with the law firm of Abernathy, Roeder, Boyd, and Joplin, could not be reached for comment. Brewer's file feel, Brewer fills in with Frisco City Attorney Richard Abernathy is unavailable. She has set in on many meetings, including the City Council and the Planning and Zoning Commission, to offer legal advice meeting minutes lists for us filling in as a city attorney as early as March 1999. Brewer also handles legal issues related to public records requests for the city of Frisco. 
She recently sought a legal opinion from the Texas Attorney General's Office for information requests from multiple media outlets related to a double homicide in Frisco. A 16-year-old boy was arrested on suspicion of fatally shooting his parents on August 11. And again, I ask you, who cashes in? Does this boy cash in for killing his parents, or do the attorneys cash in when they kill children's parents and take the children off into the Department of Health and Human Services? As a foster care child, he's very lucrative to a system that runs on human trafficking. as a potential latchkey child now, as a potential criminal element now that his parents were murdered in front of him. And they've done this so many times before. You know, the, the, the two famous ones, the brothers that killed their parents, supposedly killed their parents years ago, came from a very, very, very rich family go back to the media accounts and then go through the accounting on how much the attorneys have raised out of that estate. In the end, you're left questioning who killed these people, who benefits. And you will always, always find corporate counsel at the other end. Who benefits off of Michael Brown's killing, corporate counsel. Who benefits from these war zones? Corporate counsel. Pressherald.com found out the attorney charged with possessing child pornography. Police say Lawrence Ringer, 63, a well regarded employment lawyer had explicit images of children younger than 12 on his computer hard drive. Lawrence Ringer, a well-regarded lawyer who lives in Falmouth and has an office in Portland, was arrested Wednesday morning and charged with possessing child pornography. Maine State Police said Winger, 63, turned himself in at the Cumberland County Jail nine days after computer crimes unit searches of his home at 12 Bay Shore Drive and his office on Pearl Street. The searches yielded a laptop computer and two external hard drives, one of which contained dozens of images and videos of prepubescent children engaged in sexual activity, police said. None of the images appeared to be of main victims, authorities said. Winger was cooperative during the searches, said Detective Justin Kitteridge of the Computer Crimes Unit who made their arrest. Winger was accompanied by his lawyer, Neil Buffett, Duffett, when he surrendered Wednesday and was released on $500 bail. The case will be turned over to the Cumberland County District Attorney's Office for prosecution. Police said images of child pornography available over the internet were traced some time ago to an IP address for a computer at Winger's home. They executed a search warrant there August 18th, but the laptop and hard drives they sought were not there. Winger consented to a search of his office where the devices were found and even showed investigators where the pornographic files were stored on its hard drive, said Sergeant Lori Northrop, a computer crimes unit supervisor. He admitted deliberately keeping the hard drive containing the pornography Northrop said. Police said Winger is charged with possessing sexually explicit images of children under 12, a Class C felony punishable by up to five years in prison. It's more serious than the state charge of possessing sexual images of children ages 13 to 15, which is a misdemeanor punishable up by up to a year in jail. Winger did not immediately respond to a message left Wednesday on the answer machine at his law office. Winger, who is married and has two grown children, is a respected attorney in the field of labor and employment law who sometimes presents seminars on the subjects. He interacted with several colleagues at the, colleagues at the main H our convention during the past week in Rockland. Several lawyers contacted Wednesday, declined to talk about Winger or the charge he faces. Winger graduated magna cum laude from Yale with a degree in economics in 1972 and cum laude from Harvard Law School in 1975 according to a profile accompanying a blog he wrote about employment law. He also authored the quote, Main Employer's Handbook, end quote. 
Winger has represented clients in several high-profile cases. He was the attorney for Jordan Meats when it was sued by an employee, a refugee from Afghanistan, who said he regularly suffered religious and racial harassment at the Portland Company. A federal jury ruled in 2005 that the man's rights were violated, violated but he was not entitled to monetary damages. A decision later upheld by an appeals court. Wait a second, who won? The attorneys won that lawsuit. All the attorneys, they all cashed in. Racism was displayed. He was terrorized by the corporation. And darn the luck, yes, they did discriminate against you. However, you don't get any money for that. The attorneys do. Guess that's how the ball bounces here in the land of genocide. Winger also defended the city of Westbrook against discrimination claims by a female firefighter who claims were upheld by the Maine Human Rights Commission. He represented Han Hannaford Brothers when an Oakland man sued the grocery chain for refusing to sell him alcohol. Star employees said the man had slurred speech and a rambling gay, which turned out to be the result of a car crash ten years earlier. Federal court ruled in the man's favor and the company changed its alcohol sales policy. According to his blog profile, Winger was chairman of the Human Resources Committee of the Maine Chamber of Commerce and Industry from 95, 1993 to 1995. He's a member of the Maine Bar Association and the Maine Trial Lawyers Association. And doggone it, Winger has no previous criminal record in Maine, according to the State Bureau of Identification. He was a good attorney. He was a great attorney. From RT.com, woman working four jobs to make ends meet dies while napping in car between ships. A New Jersey woman who worked four jobs who sometimes wouldn't sleep for five days, according to a co-worker, died Monday while napping between shifts in her car on the side of the road. Maria Fernandez died in her 2001 Kia Sportage after inhaling carbon monoxide and fumes from an overturned gas container she kept in her car, according to the New York Daily News. The 32-year-old Newark woman pulled into a WAWA convenience store lot in Elizabeth, New Jersey for a nap early Monday. She left the car running. The carbon monoxide and gasoline fumes were the likely cause of death, authorities said. Fernandez was found dead in the car around eight hours later when EMTs responded to a 911 call of a woman found in a vehicle with closed windows and doors. Emergency workers sensed a strong chemical odor, odor upon entering the vehicle, authorities said. Quote, this sounds like someone who tried desperately to work and make ends meet and met with a tragic accident. Elizabeth, please... Lieutenant Daniel Solner said, according to NGA.com, an autopsy this week failed to determine the exact cause of death. Police are awaiting results of toxicology tests, Solner said, adding that no foul play is suspected. Fernandez immigrated to the United States from po Portugal. She's one of the tired and poor and huddled masses. I'll continue reading. She was beloved by co-workers at the Penn Station Dunkin' Donuts in Manhattan who called her a model employee. Quote, she used to work like three shifts every day, end quote, Parth Patel told NJ.com, quote, sometimes she wouldn't sleep for five days, end quote. Fernandez also logged shifts at the chain stores Linden and Harrison, New Jersey locations, co-workers said. Quote, she was a very sweet person, a hard-working person, said Ravina Ramjit. She was always joking around with everybody. Co-workers said Fernandez often sang Michael Jackson songs at work, mim mimicking his dance moves on the job. She had planned to take a break from her job this Friday to celebrate Jackson's birthday at a Central Park memorial, according to NJ.com. About 7.5 million Americans are working more than one job, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. 
Those jobs often leave people short on income compared to full-time work, said Carl Van Horn, director of the John J. Ha Heldrick Center for Workforce Development at Rutgers University. Quote, these are folks who would like to work full-time, but they can't find the jobs, end quote. Wait a second. Wait one minute. She was working for one of Congress's corporations, Dunkin' Donuts, a very large corporation that thrives on corporate welfare. She could not afford to live, and she was working sometimes three shifts per day, which for anyone who's not good at math means eight times three, which is 24. She was working 24 hours a day in Nazi Germany and finally died due to being a slave in Nazi Germany. And we'll talk right now. I think I've got Bo on the line with me. Do I got? Do I have you, Bo? Well, yeah. I would just like to chime in a little bit about that story right there. Whatever happened to the general welfare clause? Okay. That's what we've been and then, asking. and then everybody's you know pointing the fingers at, at these other uh, so-called countries that have these slave labor type scenarios set up. But here, the attorneys actually get us to do it to ourselves, to work ourselves to death. Okay, and they do that by controlling the uh, monetary rates, inflation through the IMF. Uh, controlling the forces, all economic force, all social and political force upon everybody, IRS, CPS, taxation, uh, forever they've been holding the gas and oil and everything else they, they they hold everything and so she's forced forced by Congress to kill herself working to make ends meet now this this citizen that just died uh, because she couldn't make ends meet we came across a story yesterday about uh, the poorest members of Congress that apparently, you know, they can't make ends meet either. And, and they're almost as poor as Hillary and Bill Clinton. Yes. Oh, my goodness. They're so poor. Yeah, go ahead and break that down. What I like here is they actually disclose some finances of some of these lower-hanging fruit here. And, oh, I don't know. Let's see. uh Let's see. These men and women may occupy some of the biggest positions in government, but they may be paupers among princes, according to data collected by the Center for Responsive Politics. The senators and representatives on this list disclosed liabilities exceeding their assets, millions of dollars in legal fees, mortgages, and debts, on family farms are just some of the forces dragging down these lawmakers' finances. To tabulate each legislator's net worth, the CRP takes data from the financial disclosure forms that members of Congress are required to file every year. They are required to report only ranges for the values of their assets, not exact figures. For example, one representative had stock in Ford Motor that totaled anywhere from roughly 2000 to 30000 doesn't narrow it down very much, does it? Yeah, plus or minus 28000 That's quite, a, quite an impressive estimate. Therefore, the CRP came up with the three members based on these estimates, a possible minimum and maximum amount, and average of the two. The CRP bases its ranking on that average. We have listed all three. The rankings are based on the average estimate net worth uh, and then um, well they said that they couldn't include their personal homes that they were living in or their vacation properties that was not included in their um, overall asset base right uh, let's see these members also do not include 
a lawmaker lawmakers primary home or vacation spots according to the blog post on CRP's website unless they collect rent on these properties lawmakers are exempted from reporting these as assets even if they are worth millions so already right in the front of this you see they're hiding a lot of assets right at the top no not Congress yes which but means with transgression Okay, can't say that enough. And you people, for the most part, out there, probably most don't listen to any of our radio shows. You're right out there trying to pick uh, one transgressor over another, which is crazy as a soup sandwich. Let's see here. Thus, these are estimates at best, but they provide an illuminating look into the wealth or lack thereof for many of the country's political leaders. Figures are from 2012, the most recent year available from the CRP's data crunching. And let's see here. We've got. Uh, Who's the poorest? Now, this is the absolute poorest, right? Uh, let's see here. Looks like it. Yeah. Representative Stephen Fincher, Republican from Tennessee, says minimum 1.1. Four nine or about one one point one five oh one million hundred and fifty thousand dollars average they're estimating four seventy two thousand and then maximum two hundred four thousand nine hundred ninety five I don't know why those are switched around like and, that and but, that's the poorest but but, but, but just take the average yeah being four hundred seventy two thousand dollars in the hole Okay, oh, I see. That's in the hole. Uh, might seem like a bad spot, but Open Secrets data says Fincher's situation has improved since 2010, when his record when his record showed him to be five. No, I'm sorry, 3.3 million dollars in debt. Most of his household's liabilities are loans on farm equipment. His 2012 records indicate his family has up to 1.65 million dollars in loans for a farm valued at no more than 1 million. Then we got uh, representative Nydia M. Valaquez, Democrat from New York. And we'll just go with the average figure they show 510,000, about a half million dollars. Okay. Valaquez was worth an estimated 1.8 million in 2004 but the data sense that uh, then suggests she may have fallen on harder times. In 2012, her household's assets included investments in real estate investment trusts. At the time, she could have as much as $780,000 in debts from two mortgages and revolving charge accounts. Now, revolving charge accounts are basically just, uh, you know, when you take, one credit card to pay off another. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, who has that kind of credit though? Like, uh, the average plebeian citizen is not going to be able to get away with doing that revolving charging stuff and um, have anywhere near that amount of credit. Uh, but these are congressmen. Oh, yeah. All bow down before the almighty, omnipotent grand poobahs called Congress. Now, i got to stop you there and, and remind all of our listeners that <coughs> these, are, these are the poorest members of Congress. So if you'd like to donate, like newspapers, so they can stay warm this winter, you know, you can probably send it to your representatives. Yeah. Well, maybe then um, be you know, more, uh, you know, of a possibility to have to make a donation to their prison fund, hopefully. Uh, let's see here. Even, let's see here. Okay, the Republican, or I'm sorry, Representative Ruben Hinoza, Democrat of Texas. And the average shows 2303000 even though Hinoza's debt was estimated to be more than $2 million in 2012, he disclosed a robust portfolio of family financial holdings, much of it in stocks, including Amazon, Apple, 
and Chipotle Mexican Grill. Representative L. C. L. Hastings, Democrat out of Florida, average day list is four million seven hundred thirty-two thousand. He's one of the poorest. Mm-hmm. Hastings listed assets totaling no more than fifteen thousand dollars in 2012, and he owed more than two million, and as much as seven point three million in legal fees. In legal fees, the attorney was redistributing them all. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's uh, that started what? Uh, well. You notice a lot of these things started around 2012, which is interesting. Uh, some of which he spent in the 1980s, it says, on legal fees, fighting an impeachment trial and other legal battles while serving as a U.S. district judge, according to the U.S. Senate website. Absolutely. Attorneys are cannibals. So, I mean, look at all this waste in, in, in litigation fees alone. Okay? It's just the accepted norm here for these Congress critters because they love litigation. Absolutely. They just love it. Absolutely. And then we have Representative David Vallejo, Republican of California, shows an average of 12167000 Oh, that poor guy. He's almost homeless. Lato unseated Hastings as the poorest member of Congress in 2012 due to debts he owed on dairy farms registered in Hanford, a town in the district he represents, according to the CRP. Lato actually listed assets worth up to roughly $5.5 million, including his farms. Yeah. And, and remember, they, these asset bases do not include their vacation homes or their primary residence. Which a lot of them are what Sierra Leone or yep Guinea Sierra Leone hmm all of the nice right, African that's, that's right out there where that Ebola outbreak is yeah and it only affects those that are like primates and missing the frontal lobe it's just so profound that um, you know it, it looks like revelation plague plays out against the bad guys. From SACB.com, Sacramento Elder Law Attorney charged with financial elder abuse. Sacramento attorney whose website extols his expertise in championing the elderly and ensuring that they are not taken advantage of was arraigned Thursday on felony charges of financial elder abuse, grant theft, and securities fraud. Attorney Delbert Joe Maudlin, 63, who was being held on 500,000 bail since his arrest Tuesday, agreed to stop practicing law and seeing clients until the criminal proceedings are complete. In exchange, bail was reduced to $100,000 for the attorney who has been licensed to practice law in California since 1987. Maudlin's appearance in an orange jumpsuit in Sacramento Superior Court and his identification as a lawyer drew grasps and whispered comments from audience members. He did not enter a plea on Thursday. That's okay. A judge will enter it for him. He's oh, not yeah. able to. Attorneys in black dresses are good at that one. Oh, yeah. Well, this was kind of interesting. Um... I thought, Tammy, did you see this on the, there's been a 422% increase in price to leave the quote-unquote land of the free. Absolutely. They got that expatriation schematic a few years ago. I think it was like 2008 or so when IRS came in and said, well, if you want to expatriate from the United States Incorporated, we're going to audit you for the last eight years to ensure you're not trying to avoid taxes and all that crap. It's ridiculous. So they just jack up the price of, of expatriating, expatriating their way. Their way. Because as you know, the United States Incorporated has you coming and going. And if you believe that they are an authority and you don't realize that they went bankrupt in 1933 and they don't have any... Why they can't charge you those exorbitant rates for trying to leave a prison camp? Now, okay, they talk about. See, um, starts out the question: What do actor Jet Li, opera singer Maria Callas, writer T. S. Eliot, 
and financer John Templeton, actress Elizabeth Taylor, and Queen Noor of Jordan all have in common. They are all former U.S. citizens who went through the formal process, that's the law merchant's process, of relinquishing or announcing or renouncing their citizenship. Liz Taylor actually restored her U.S. citizenship in the late 70s. Till a couple of years ago, there wasn't much of a fuss about this. It was rare an occurrence for someone to renounce his or her citizenship. Fast forward a few decades, the government is now flat broke, actually in the red to the tune of 17 trillion. Uh, that's just the uh, what they're reporting as the national debt. They're not including derivatives in that. Right. Uh, and chasing people to the ends of the earth to get their fair share of your lifetime earnings. Right. Israel's listed as a corporation in Washington, D.C., and there's tax treaties and the tax information there that claim, are evidence that residency is always in the U.S. incorporated. It doesn't matter where you go until you patronize your own house rather than the House of Representatives. Yeah, so now, uh, let's see here. Well, to all of the attorneys that just had a light bulb go off and you're thinking, man, all I have to do is repatriate it in my own house. No. No. You took an oath to the bar, a fictional entity, and in doing so, that was uh, called a, an assignment. And, of course, a stop by a signer kicks in and says, no, you've already divested yourself, you've already given up all the interests in your estate by that oath you took to a foreign government, and um, you're going to have to be claimed by somebody else. Somebody else has to forcefully take you over as property. So before you get any other good ideas, like the attorney that tried to whittle off her fingerprints and stuff, it's not good. It doesn't work. So, well anyways, um, at one time Let's see here. A couple years ago, they uh, imposed a $450 fee to expatriate. Now, um, as of just yesterday or the day before, it increased once again to $2,350, which is a 400, a 422% increase. In its explanation, the State Department whined that the cost of processing renunciations had simply become too high. Right, they've got to fill out UCC1 forms and all that stuff to put the victim subject into the shoot again because you're not patronizing anything outside of the U.S. government, even if you expatriate. Right, you patronate into uh, another corporation. Uh, Canada or wherever you go, and you're another, you're under um, another government that's a corporation listed at Washington, D.C. Uh, or Delaware at Dun & Bradstreet. Right. Right, so you're not really going anywhere, you just, they're making up a show and you get to be uh, redistributed of your assets. You get a, a mandatory eight-year audit from the IRS that will always find retirement accounts. It'll always find assets that you're trying to hide from the United States Incorporated. That's what it does, and it has every tool available under fourth-generation warfare to do so. And again... 1929 Geneva Convention says that everybody's a prisoner of war if they don't have a government. Canada went bankrupt in 1933. United States Incorporated went bankrupt in 1933. Germany, Austria, Israel, Palestine, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, all of these places because Congress went bankrupt in 1933 and the, these were all corporations under Congress. No. You know, you need to patriot under under your own house. That's the only lawful way that you're not going to be picked up as a prisoner of war under the 1929 Geneva Convention. Right. If you're using their forms and their laws and all their private acts and acts of commerce, they got you right where they want you. Absolutely, and that's why they employ all these agents and the reason that they're broke. Walter Burian found almost 800,000 agents on, on federal and state employee that don't have departments, they don't have titles and everything, they just run around like Donna Lee Ray pushing the UCC1 process and the other shoes. You got one this morning that was quite 
heavy against you. And it was, oh, yeah, it was the one that uh, decided to quit uh, pretending to be my friend. Yeah, that was interesting to watch. Yeah, well, you, you get that a lot. <laughs> well, he, was, he was going and going and going on and 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 and I, I, I just... Law merchant. It's a room about the public law. It's the one right. I use for the radio show. Absolutely. So I posted Matthew 27, and all of a sudden he just, he left all by himself. You know, it's like, or Matthew 12, sorry. If you're not with me, you're against me. And then, poof, he was gone. And it was, it was very interesting to see, because for so long he had pretended to be... Uh, a friend. And yeah, and he outed himself for everything he is. Uh, he said, I'm a private person. Absolutely. You know, after I, you know, lecture on and on and on and continually about uh, private versus public, okay. foreign versus sovereign. And, um, yeah, so he wa he likes being a foreign state. Absolutely. He, didn't, he even called himself that. Well, and I think he spiked out because he sees what's coming, and it's so sad because, you know, I guess whatever floats your boat. Did you see... Oh, they all see what's coming. I got one here, though. This kind of, I meant to segue into the uh, story about the poor Congress critters. Uh, the Ring of Steel. The U.K. spends $80 million on massive fence to protect politicians ahead of NATO summit. Oh, yeah. $80 million to protect... These criminals. Corporations. Now, well, criminals, corporations. Well, you know. Sick. Uh, let's see. Most of us woke up this morning to the news that the UK had raised its terror threat level from substantial to severe. Now, considering the competence and trust trustworthiness of the nation's Joint Terrorism Analysis Center. There must be some specific threat they're concerned about to justify instilling fear in a population of 65 million. But nope. Although the new threat level rates the risk of an attack on the UK to highly likely, Home Security Theresa May stated that there was no evidence to suggest one was imminent. Well then, makes you wonder, in the change in threat level, or if the change in threat level is being used in part to justify the extraordinary $80 million sum spent on building a fortress around the Newsport and Cardiff City centers in Wales, which, which many are describing as similar to the Berlin Wall or a zoo, in unprecedented display of protection for many of the world's most corrupt politicians. See, that's them saying that. That's not even me. Absolutely, and, and Theresa May is talking against it. And I've been seeing a lot of that recently. Since she came in to um, play here, uh, she seems to be adhering to the public law while everybody around her is just falling down on the job. I mean, David Cameron and everybody, it's just, it's just they're in chaos, building fences. Stepping up security, they're they're claiming an ISIS threat now, an ISIS threat against the Pope, an ISIS threat at Chicago, which was evidence to have come from no, none other than the FBI. All of these things, and and um, Rick Perry did the same thing. The minute he was on the hook under indictment, he starts espousing off. Oh my gosh, ISIS is coming! You need me! You need me! It's interesting. These things are so ridiculous. BBC, the BBC reports that a security ring of steel is already in place at key sites in Cardiff and in Newport, some 12 miles of fencing with pedestrian access points. That's 20 kilometers. More than 150 heads of state and ministers, including U.S. President Barack Obama, will attend the two-day summit. The entourage will include around 10,000 support staff while 2,000 journalists are also expected to attend. The man heading the security operation, which includes 1,500 officials from South Wales, has described it as completely uncharted territory for British policing and said discreet armed protection would also be used. To mark the summit, the Royal Mint has struck a limited edition bronze commemorative coin Although not legal tender, the 150 coins feature the NATO logo and the words NATO Summit Wales 2014 in English and Welsh. I'm not sure they found time to create a common uh, or a, uh, 
co com co commem commemorative coin and amid all the imminent terror attacks. No, I'm, I'm sure glad they found time to yeah. create a commemorative coin and amid all the imminent terrorist attacks. Always, it's a gimmick. Come on. We're, we're, they're building Auschwitz right before the, uh, you know, everybody's walked into these gas chambers and stuff. I mean, now, the quick cheat sheet says uh, uh, this is all for a two day summit, but now this is what they're going to be spending. Uh, 9,500 9, police will be present. Almost 10,000 police. Seven NATO warships will be stationed off the Welsh coast. Twelve miles of steel fencing has been erected. The fencing will be nine feet tall around Cardiff and Newport. There's a bunch of photos there. Some more if you want to read it. Blacklisted news. Um question so how do the bureaucrats justify such ridiculous spending terrorism of course Absolutely. but who are they really afraid of who's really the terrorist that they're talking about okay. it's you the citizens starting to wake up to this whole elaborate human trafficking genocidal scheme that they keep coercing you into voting for and then you find a nine foot still structure between you and your enemy protecting your enemy from you that's your reward ferguson look at that 40 fbi agents showed up and then the national guard protecting that corporate council yeah it's just unbelievable um and they must really really feel the news tightening around their necks here to oh, yeah, uh the pope Pope, he wrapped himself up in security this last week. Oh, yeah. He said ISIS is going to attack him, too. Yep. He's scared of the wrath of God, it sounds like. Hey, did you, you heard all this stuff about John Rivers. I think you reported on it on Wednesday night. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess it's gotten um, uh, worse. And um, let's see, her daughter, Melissa... Uh, remains in, uh, you know, she says that uh, her mother remains in medical induced coma. Yeah, they have her own life support. Interesting. So it really took a turn for the worse here somehow, some for some reason. Um, not long after she would come out and called Michelle Obama a man, too, might I add. Right. Oh, I hope she's not, like, hit. That is I mean, they do it often. Well, it's what they do. I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. Would it surprise you? No, no, especially in this quiet, soft cell manner. Didn't she go in under the knife and all of these accidents started to occur after that? I believe it was some sort of procedure she went in for initially. It was just supposed to be well, a... We, uh, we witnessed the same thing with Joseph Reynolds when they hit him. You know, it was that attorney that beat the heck out of him in the first place to get him in a nursing home, and then, you know, his lethal execution came after that. Yeah, so... Um... Yeah, I don't know what else to say about it, really. Uh, you know, I mean... Because, uh... She, she... I mean, she's also... Um, yeah, okay, she uh, was uh, poking at Michelle Obama, but, you know, she's always uh, uh, taking the side of, of Israel and uh, claiming it's a good thing to go and, uh, you know, blow up all those Palestinian babies and children and wreck the families and raise Palestine, you know, which that is the biggest ongoing Job experiment on the planet. Absolutely. How much are you going to take? How much are you going to take? World say we're over here. We're bombing them poor Palestinians again. You know, what do you think? Oh, you're not going to say anything. Well, we're going to keep on right on doing it. She's only been in a medically induced coma since I think yesterday, and um, sadly, her friend, who someone claiming to be her friend, says, "quote uh, Joan would never want to be a burden on anyone." A close friend told the Daily News, quote, if she can't recover and live a full and active life, she would rather be gone. It's pretty sad. She just now 
went on life support and it's an induced coma it's not like uh, she was in a coma before the doctors started drugging her it's an induced coma uh, it says Rivers 81 was placed in a coma Thursday after going into cardiac and respiratory arrest during a routine doctor's visit you notice how she just it happened to occur right in the doctor's visit. It's just amazing how that happens. Sick. It's creepy as hell, and I pray God that nobody's going to visit any doctors because they're they're just uh, man, we've alone just uh, between the Bone Rocker show and leaving the farm and and all of our experience, we've evidence that this is indeed their oper uh, modus operandi. This is how they get rid of overhead, and it's just. Oh, wow. Okay, the uh, headline I read earlier over the Daily Mail talked about how the uh, an Amish couple had, uh, let's see, I, I think they used the word abducted or something, their own child. I don't know how you could abduct your own child from a hospital. Cause, uh, and they're on the run. They're on the lam because they don't want their kid going back to this hospital. So right. they was, know something. Right. And there was another one this last week as well that was charged with kidnapping and, and everything else. No, there's no such thing. If the parents do not want their children in a hospital, you, you're not going to force them anymore. Period. Now, it, it Kim jong un has got trouble with the with the banker here did you read that one no is this something from um, earlier today uh, let's see here yes it was let me see here if I can get it uh... yeah. no well, okay also the pro wrestling thing has been going on and uh... Let's see Kim Un uh, have have a go if you think you're hard enough. Pro wrestling returns to North Korea for the first time in 20 years. Pro wrestling expedition held in Pyongyang for the first time in 20 years. The event was arranged by a member of the Japanese parliament. Japan is trying to improve its relationship with uh, what they call the bizarre hermit state. Hermit state. Yeah. They were calling it the hermit kingdom. Um, before, and um, it, it's interesting that they've, they're using different words now. Um, yeah, that other banker one was on DailyMail.co.uk. Top North Korean banker absconds with three million dollar million pounds from Kim Jong Un's slush fund. Oh, okay, we'll have to cover that on the Bowen Rocker Show Wednesday here because that's interesting. Be well, everybody.